Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to M240. Um, my name is Greg Cook. I'm uh, going to be instructing this class this year. Uh, hopefully it's going to go well. I have, actually haven't uh, taught this specific class before, uh, but I have taught the Organic Chemistry 341-342 series um, for many years here. Uh, is this microphone working? Change that a little bit. Um, so I, I thought what I'd do is uh, go through some introductory information in the class, talk a little bit about uh, what I'm going to be expecting from you, uh, because you're all very interested in learning organic chemistry, right? Um, OK. Uh, as I said, my name is Greg Cook. My office is actually located right here on the first floor of Lab Hall. Um, in the 104 office complex, and I'm all the way in the back corner. Um, so you can find me there, uh, 360A, I'm sorry, that's wrong, 104G, that's the one here. I do have a, another office upstairs, but I'm not there that often. Uh, but uh, sometimes I may be up there. For office hours, one of, the, one of the difficult things for me this year with this class is that I'm the department chair, and I get a lot of uh, unexpected scheduled meetings. So I've tried to set aside some office hours right after class, but that's certainly not the only time I'm available. So please, if you do need to see me, um, send me an email, make an appointment. I can always squeeze in time here and there. I just have a hard time predicting when that would be. Um, so that's probably the best thing if you want to get a hold of me and, and visit me in my office is to send an email and make an appointment. Um, but I will try to be available after class um, at least for an hour. There are a couple of uh, scheduled meetings I have that might interfere, so please uh, uh, forgive if I have to cancel a, an office uh, an hour at, at the last minute. Um, okay, my phone number's there, my email's there, and uh, I do have a, a web page. How many people have seen the web page already? Okay, good, because I'll be putting all the information on there. Um, I will be using Blackboard probably mostly for putting on the grades so you can have access to your grades. Uh, but most of the information and content and everything that I'll be making available will be on the web page. A little bit about me. I thought I'd just start uh, introducing myself to you. Um, because this is an organic chemistry class, I thought I might tell you a little bit of background about um, uh, or my chemistry background. Actually, I've been interested in sciences all the way back to high school, uh, where I had two years of chemistry in high school, and that, that uh, piqued my interest in it. But I'll, I'll be honest, how many people uh, struggled through general chemistry and found it boring? I did too. I didn't like general chemistry. It was all tedious algebra and calculate this and calculate that. It actually wasn't until I took an organic chemistry class that I discovered that chemistry is a lot more than that. Uh, it's when you can really understand what's happening on the molecular level and make sense of that, that's when it really gets to be exciting. And I wouldn't be a chemist without my high school chemistry teacher, so I always like to give him kudos for that. Not many high schools have organic chemistry. In it, so. uh, I've actually been at NDSU since 1996. Love it here. Um, I will probably always be a bison, so that's good. Um, and a little bit more about myself. Uh, anybody recognize this molecule up here on the, left, on the right side? So we're going to chemistry class. We should talk about molecules, right? Lactic acid, that's right. Do you know what lactic acid, what the indications of lactic acid are in health? Exercise, that's right. So when you overuse your muscles, it produces lactic acid. And if you do too much of that, then your muscles will cramp up and hurt. And I, I know this because I've run several marathons um, and have hit that wall, and I know a lot about lactic acid. Uh, a few other things. I like to garden. So if you want any cucumbers, I brought a whole bunch into the main office. Grab one before you leave. I picked 60 pounds yesterday. So. Um, of course, I like to cook, and I'm an organic chemist, and I think organic chemistry and cooking have a lot in common. Um, I also make wine, if anyone's interested in wine making. I haven't beer, brewed beer yet, but uh, that might be something I might do at some point. Uh, actually, there's a lot of chemistry and organic chemistry in wine, and uh, <coughs> that's another conversation we can have at some point. Most importantly, I know a lot of people have trepidations about organic chemistry. 
Uh, some people tell me it's the hardest class they've ever taken, um, and they really worry about it. But I, I, I want you to know I want you guys to succeed in organic chemistry. And I know this is a survey course. There's a lot of material that uh, is hard to go a lot in depth, um, but I, I want you to come away from this class with an appreciation for chemistry, organic chemistry, and what it, it uh, how it impacts in everyday life. And if I can do that, I think then I've succeeded. Okay, some of you said you've been to the web page. Here's a, a screenshot of the web page. Uh, most of the information will probably be under the uh, lectures part, so I'll put all the slides for my um, presentations. Um, I will, I'm trying to capture video of what I display on the screen so that uh, you can view it later if you need to go back and review things. Although it is a good idea to still take notes. Okay, so don't forget to take notes. Um, some of the slides aren't completely filled out and I'll be drawing on it. Hopefully the technology will work that I can draw and it'll show up on the screen. Um, all that will be captured in video. I'm still working on the audio part, so hopefully uh, uh, the audio will be picked up okay. Uh, another thing is uh, supplemental instruction. We're fortunate to have a TA dedicated to this class this year. Uh, Sandeep, right here, is our supplemental instruction leader. Um, he will be scheduling some sessions outside of class time for small groups if you have questions about the material, um, or he can prepare review material for it, for the topics, um, especially I think when the exam times come around, he'll be very busy. Uh, but uh, stay tuned to the web page on the GitHub link for uh, updates on when those sessions will be scheduled. Um, probably start uh, in a couple of weeks, I imagine, if not next week. We just need to find class times, uh, classrooms and times available uh, for those small sessions. Um, if you do need more help, there are a couple other avenues I would suggest you explore. One of the things I think that are underutilized are all of the other organic laboratory TAs. They have a lot of good knowledge about organic chemistry. They should have office hours as well. So even if they're not your lab TA or if you're not taking a lab, um, they might be able to help out. Uh, ACE Tutoring has some... Uh, tutors available for Chem 240. I think at least one has signed up for Chem 240. You can check the online schedule for ACE Tutoring um, and see when 240 tutors will be available. Uh, and of course, all the other things that one can make use of. So there is some help available. How many people bought the book already? Great. I just want to check. It did come with an access code, right? Have, have you enrolled it with the OWL online? Okay. I would, I haven't heard yet from anyone how successful that is, so I do want to know if there are any problems with that. So as you uh, get that textbook, um, enroll in the online. I am going to try out the online homework system this year uh, from this textbook. It comes free bundled with your book. Uh, if you do have any problems getting enrolled in that, let me know. Yes, question? Uh, yeah. Uh I'm an idiot, I didn't grab the book yet. I okay. was going to grab it in a day or two. Um, I just want to know when the first homework due, because obviously I need to get it before then. Good question. When is the first homework due? Well, there are two things that I made available already. Has anyone logged on to look yet? I, I, I have an assignment for uh, Chapter 1, and I have a, there's a, um, an introduction to how to use the online homework system. Now, I did set a due date of next Monday. Um, that might be a little early, so I will probably be extending that. It might take a more than a week for everyone to get on board. So I'll be monitoring the access and we'll see how that goes. Okay, so, but if we can target by next Monday, that would be good. Question? Um, okay, so I got my book from like, Jay. Instead of buying it, so obviously just buying it. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so if you go to the webpage and, and look under the homework link, there's a, a sheet from uh, Cengage which lists how you could uh, access to purchase the uh, just the online system separately. Uh, I did get a good deal on the book bundle, so hopefully you didn't pay more. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you don't if you have if you don't have the textbook itself, you can you can purchase the owl online uh, from Cengage directly. There's a couple ways to do that, I think. but there, there's a handout link. On the web page. Okay, grading in this class. I, I've uh, set out the grading in this way. What I'm planning to do is have 
uh, three exams throughout this semester uh, during class time. So three midterm exams, and then the final exam will be um, comprehensive. Um, the point systems are here, 60% total for the exams. 30% uh, of your grade will be from the final exam. And uh, homework, about 10% of your grade. And I'll just uh, take all those points for the homework and scale it to 10% uh, or 50 points. Um, grading scale, what I've set out, uh, typically I find that these cutoffs for A, B, C, D uh, line up pretty well with um, the class that I teach. So hopefully that works out well. Um, I will never adjust that up. Uh, depending on how the class does overall and how I teach this class, we'll see if that needs to be um, uh, curved downward at some point to make it better for you. Now the other thing I will have in this class is unannounced quizzes. So that means you have to come to class. Um, my, the idea is to, to have quizzes which uh, cover topics that are the shorter term throughout the class, maybe a, a week or two's worth of material might be hit on those quizzes. Um, and those quizzes could replace your lowest test score if the total of the quizzes is higher than um, your lowest test. I will do that automatically. Here are the dates for the exams. I, I, please write them down now. Um, I do have a schedule for the course uh, on topics, although that can always change. But the, the exam dates are going to be set in stone, um, hopefully, if there are no issues or problems. Uh, final exam on the Thursday, so make sure you put that on your calendar at a different time. Uh, also, if you, it, it's really hard to do makeup exams after the fact, and I, but I do realize that people have uh, school functions and things that they need to go to sometimes that might uh, cause you to miss an exam. Uh, please contact me about a week ahead of time and arrange to take the exam uh, before. Yes? You might have. Uh, oh, yes, I do. Sorry. That was a case here. That should be December. It's the Thursday of the December finals week. 18th? 18th, yes. Thank you. Good. You're on your toes. Third midterm in November, then travel back in time, take the final lap year. That works. Um, uh, okay. Uh, policy on the unannounced quizzes. Actually, the quizzes are are a good deal for you because I'm actually giving six quizzes, and I'll take the top five of those quizzes and add them together, and that will re that could replace your lowest test score. And I even give a bonus point on each one. So each quiz is 21 points. So you have the possibility of getting 105 points to replace a 100 point exam. So it should have no complaints about grades. Hopefully, we'll see how it goes. Um, no makeup quizzes, so don't even ask. They're unannounced. Um, so if you miss a quiz, that's why I take the top five of the six to help for those things. Homework system, as I said, uh, on the web page. Check out uh, the, the handout on the homework and how to access that. And I think there should be some more information once you register in the online homework system about how it works and, and help and tutorials available there. So please do that soon. Okay, so that's the syllabus. Any questions on the syllabus and, and uh, expectations for grades? Okay, let's talk a little bit about organic chemistry. Uh, I have my philosophy about organic chemistry and I want to share a little bit of that um, because I think one of the things is that students approach organic chemistry in the wrong way and it actually interferes with their understanding of it because I'm not actually looking for rote memorization of things. I'm looking for you to have, be able to take information and put together different concepts to answer and solve problems. That's really the key to organic chemistry. And that's why a lot of programs require students to take organic chemistry. Not because you're going to need to know the stereochemistry of a nucleophilic substitution reaction when you go out to a job, but you need to know how to solve problems on the spot and think and connect information. So the exercise of doing organic chemistry and learning organic chemistry it really trains one to do that. That being said, it is a lot like, uh, I think, like 
trying to learn a language. Okay, in many contexts, you can think about there are things that you do have to learn. There's vocabulary. Every science has its own terminology, uh, words that you have to understand so that you can communicate with each other. And not just words. In chemistry, it's more than just words that make up vocabulary. Uh, it's structures, it's functional groups, it's uh, chemical moieties that we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about. Uh, and then those are things that, yes, you do have to get into your head and remember because you can't, you can't speak a language unless you know the words, unless you know the vocabulary. So once you learn that, then it's about how to put them together. That's the grammar. That's the uh, constructing sentences, if you will, or, or chemical sentences. So knowing about reactivity, knowing electronic properties, knowing how if you see a functional group in one molecule, how it might behave in another molecule should be similar if you know the general properties. So if you can learn concepts and properties of things as we go along, then it should make it a lot easier for you to connect the dots and uh, put that all together. So again, if you, if you think you can just memorize everything, uh, you'll never succeed because there's just too much to memorize. You have to learn the concept so that you can solve the problem without having to put everything into your brain. Um, so I do expect that. I expect you to be able to take what you learn and connect it beyond what you've just memorized. Um, that's really what chemistry is about. So you can go through some of these things. I do have some suggestions. Um, People have different learning styles, so these are just suggestions, but they're things that help me when I learned organic chemistry. Um, I found that learning things um, uh, was easier for me if I used as many senses as possible when I was learning it. So not just sitting here listening to me and seeing it. Those are two senses, right? Hearing, seeing, but actually writing. Then you're actually feeling that pen on the paper. Um, I took my notes and rewrote them and rewrote them over and over again. At the same time, I spoke it out loud because then it, it uh, reinforced those concepts in my, in my head. Um, so those are things I suggest. Rewrite your notes or look at your notes. Um, study together. Uh, get help when you need it to explain things. So don't rely on uh, a misunderstanding because that can really throw you off. Uh, Molecular model sets can help. Um, organic chemistry is a very visual science. And, and if, you know those, those uh, uh, tests where you have a three-dimensional object that's been unfolded and put into a, onto the paper, and you have to say, what does that object look like? Some people are very good at visualizing that three dimensions in their head, and some people are not. Uh, it's the way the brains are wired differently. <laughs> Um, if you have trouble doing those kinds of tests, it might be a good idea to get molecular models so you can see uh, molecules in three dimension because it is a spatial, three-dimensional uh, structure that gives us a lot of insight in chemistry. Now, some people like to use flashcards. I have a, a kind of mixed feelings about flashcards when you're learning reactions because they... They tend to promote memorization rather than understanding. Um, but they can sometimes help. Uh, and I just want to say, suggest if you want, if you are going to use flashcards to remember reactions, um, think about it in, in this kind of arrangement for an organic reaction. You have some molecule or a set of molecules are substrates. Uh, that's one part of it. Uh, you have some reagents or conditions that are acting upon that uh, to do a chemical reaction, and then you have the product structures. And I, what I would, what I do, or would suggest, if you need to use flashcards to learn things, for each reaction type that you're trying to learn, make three flashcards. One where the pro you have two of these components. Let's say in this reaction, the starting material and the reagents it's reacting with. What is the product? You have the product on the back of your card. You could then do an example where you have products and conditions. What did you have to start with? It's the same reaction, just a second card, but it, with something else missing from it. Um, and of course, the third card for the same reaction would be have the reagents missing. 
So in all that, that, that describes one reaction. And on the back of the card, I would probably write more details. Starting material, reagents, products, information about the reaction, which is the major product, why it might be a major product, what's some of the details of that reaction, and mechanism, things like that. Um, so if you need to use flashcards to help learn some of the chemistry, uh, by all means do so. Be careful about memorization, but put uh, mix them up with more than one uh, card with different things missing, and I think that helps. Okay, this is actually an interesting question. Uh, do you learn better reading the book or watching videos or coming to class? Uh, I think coming to class is important. I've done statistics on this. So, for example, uh, if you one year I took some uh, attendance on students. Six times randomly throughout the year I took attendance. And I put the students into two groups. One that missed more than two of those six random attendance. And uh, those students who missed less than three. Okay, so the, what I assumed was that the students who were absent for more than two of those six times I took attendance probably uh, miss class more often and the students who have less are regularly coming to class. And if you look at the grade distribution, these are three exams and a final exam, the students who were absent more often, you can see the grade, average grades on those exams went from about 75 and continually went down um, even to the final. And so their total grade ended up somewhere below 70. If you compare that with the students who regularly came to class, there's a full grade difference. As a matter of fact, uh, although one sees the cumulative science of organic chemistry showing up as a slight decrease, but the final exam did not go down further. And overall grade uh, was more than 10 points higher than those students who didn't come to class. So if you think uh, not coming to class, uh, you can still learn it, I would say. The data doesn't support that, so please come to class. Um, hopefully, I'll make it fun for you. Um, in the syllabus, I have a, a schedule of topics, and I want to explain a little bit uh, about those topics. Um, you can see the uh, chapter, uh, about three chapters in between each exam. Uh, as I said, I haven't taught this particular class before, and I haven't taught from this book before, so I'm not quite sure about the timing of this. So we'll see how far along we get before each exam. Um, and we'll just cover material up until then. Uh, I do want to point out the last couple of chapters. This is somewhat condensed in time. So my goal here is to, is to cover most of these chapters pretty much in depth, but then the last couple of uh, slots here, I have uh, amine compounds and biomolecules, and notice there's like three chapters here. I don't expect you to learn all of those chapters and learn the whole chapter in one day. What I want to do is just cover some of the highlights and high points of those information that you might need for um, whatever degree that you're going on into. Um, so those last couple of, of topics um, will be probably even more uh, broad and, and more of a survey. A lot informational. Okay. Structure. Structure, structure is so important in organic chemistry. Um, knowing how to draw them, understanding uh, what structures mean and relate to the chemistry uh, is important. And so the more you can practice drawing structures, the better. Uh, we get more and more electronic tools that draw structures for us. We, we kind of forget how to do them by hand. Um, I would suggest practice drawing by hand. On the exams, I'll have a mixture of different kinds of questions. Some of them will be short answer drawing of structures, so you will need to know how to do that, do that well. Okay, um, in chemistry, we, we kind of divide up chemistry into various uh, different types of chemistry. You can see here physical chemistry, theoretical or computational chemistry, biochemistry, organic chemistry, they all have their own different features, but they are all about 
molecule structures and reactions uh, to some sense. And when we think about organic chemistry, uh, we should think about some of the history and background for that. Why is this a subdiscipline of chemistry? Okay. So if you look up um, the definition of chemistry, how many, ask, how many people have actually looked up the definition of chemistry before? Good job. A science that deals with the composition, structure, and properties of substances. Those nets and everything around us. Okay and the transformations that they undergo. That's the real key thing about chemistry. What are the transformations that happen uh, with substances? Um, specifically with organic chemistry, uh, there are some old definitions, there are newer definitions. Um, here's a definition from about a hundred years ago pertaining to one of the large series of substances which in nature or, or origin are connected with vital processes. Vital processes. Now this word organic um, has been used in a lot of different ways in, in our language. Okay, you know about organic gardening, right? Organic foods. What does that mean? Presumably. Uh, the answer was less preservatives and less chemicals added to those plants, right? Well, I've learned it means expensive. <laughs> That's true. It means expensive. Uh, you can say something's organic, but it uh, could cost a lot more. Um, organic could mean more toxic. <coughs> Some of the organic fertilizers are contaminated with bacteria uh, that are more toxic than, say, a pure fertilizer, one single chemical entity. So, I, you know, you can debate which of those is safer and better. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of other impacts. But the organic in that regard, I think, uh, is different than the kind of uh, what we talk about in terms of organic chemistry. Um, but it derives from the same thing. Its origins were from life, okay, natural life, living things. In the 18th century, uh, that's what they thought. All organic molecules obtained from living organisms, and they possess a, a so-called mysterious vital force, some, some life energy. Um, they thought that you couldn't make organic molecules uh, without the influence of this sort of magic life force. Uh, until in the 19th century, Frederick Wohler made an organic molecule, urea, from an inorganic salt that didn't come from anything living. So he took ammonium cyanate, which was a mineral, uh, heated that up and, and got urea, which comes from living organisms. So for the first time, they demonstrated that an organic molecule doesn't necessarily have to come from something living. Uh, also in the 20th century, there's a famous experiment by Uri and Miller. Uh, they took together uh, basic building blocks, methane, ammonia, and water, and sealed it up and discharged it with uh, electrical charges. And um, out of that mix came these organic molecules, <coughs> amino acids, okay, which th was thought to only arise from living organisms, uh, but clearly from molecules which are not derived from living organisms. Um, most of the molecules and chemicals that make up uh, living organisms are organic molecules, for example. We'll probably hit some of these at the end of the semester and talk more detail about them. Sugars, fats, and lipids, these are organic molecules. Amino acids and proteins, DNA is made up of organic molecules. Um, and these all then now um, relate to what our modern definition of organic chemistry is, uh, synthetic molecules. Uh, modern organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon compounds. You notice in all these examples, biomolecules, and we'll talk a little bit about structure in a minute, all of these lines represent carbons. Even in synthetic molecules like dyes and polymers, they have carbons in their backbone. And you've, you can see that there's all kinds of different structures one can make using carbon, the way we connect it. That's organic chemistry. It's based on carbon. 
So the, the compounds made with carbon as the backbone, uh, with a few other elements thrown in as well. So in modern organic chemistry, I I'm told you at the beginning of the class that I'm a synthetic organic chemist. Organic synthesis essentially is uh, uh, the science of figuring out how to build and make organic molecules. Put them together. Build them from the ground up. And there are reasons why we want to do that. We want to be able to control molecules in all three dimensions by making carbon-carbon bonds. Um, you, you're familiar, very well familiar with the periodic table. Most of the chemistry of organic compounds is focused here on the periodic table. Uh, carbon, of course, hydrogen <laughs> makes up the most of it, but then you, a few other elements added in provide different functional groups, provide different properties uh, appended onto those molecules, and then allow you to manipulate those organic molecules. Uh, and, and biological systems make use of these other elements also, as you saw in the when I showed you the DNA bases, there were nitrogen atoms in there. Those nitrogen atoms are very important for that uh, interaction between molecules. Organic molecules. Here's a couple other examples. A simple one. Methane is the simplest of organic molecules made up of one carbon, four hydrogens. This structure is shown here. Um, benzene. There's a structure of benzene. Also an organic molecule uh, made up of carbon and hydrogen, what we would refer to as a hydrocarbon. Anything that's just carbon and hydrogen would be hydrocarbon. Uh, they have different properties. Methane we use as a fuel. It burns. Uh, benzene, um, well, it's used as a solvent or a fuel or, or other things as well. Uh, they have different properties in terms of their toxicities. Some good, some bad. Uh, so it depends. Uh, but how do we build them, and what is, why is it useful? Uh, I love this quote um, in 2006. It's a little while ago, but uh, the director of the National Institutes of Health uh, carried out a study because he was looking at um, science funding and looking at the barriers to the progress in biomedical research, that is, uh, research in, in addressing human diseases mostly. Uh, and Interestingly, they, they could, you could look at biology, biochemistry, cellular biology, uh, any, any of these types of uh, fields of science. Uh, but what he found, what, what was really the bottleneck, was not enough synthetic organic chemistry. Because these researchers need organic molecules as tools and probes to understand these biological mechanisms, and they don't know how to make them. So they need people like me, um, fortunately, so I have a job. That's a good thing. Uh, but uh, that's an interesting outcome of that study. And I, I just want to share, uh, so one of my goals in this class is to, to try to give you an appreciation for organic chemistry and why it's important. So I just want to share a couple of stories. Uh, here's two molecules, uh, natural products. Uh, we call a natural product some molecule that we isolate from a natural source. Uh, not, not, uh, so it's found in nature. And you, you might think, well, if it's found in nature, why would we have to synthesize it or make it in a laboratory or in a, in a, a larger scale, industrial scale? Well, let me just tell you a little bit about this molecule on the bottom. It's, it's a, a little bit, uh, I would say, a little bit of a simple molecule. Epibatidine is the name of this molecule. Uh, you can see it has some carbons on it at each connection here. These are carbons. Uh, there's some other atoms in here, a couple of nitrogens and a chlorine. Um, a little bit of a simple molecule, not too large and complex. Uh, but the National Institute of Health is very interested in this molecule. It comes from Ecuador, uh, from this cute little tree frog. Actually, it's, it's found in the skins of those tree frogs. And when um, this compound was isolated from nature, 
and taken into a laboratory and tested, it was found to bind to pain receptors to uh, provide analgesic uh, pain control. So it was an interesting target that it was binding to in a biological system, uh, which, by the way, pain management, chronic pain management, still a huge, huge problem in medicine, hard to address. How is chronic pain managed today? Anybody know? Medicine therapy. Therapy, yes, um, mostly with narcotic type drugs, painkillers. People are, then get addicted to these. And it doesn't do a good job. And then people become uh, sort of used to those. Uh, and they, they have to have more and more. Chronic pain is a huge problem. This compound was 500 times more potent than morphine. But it didn't bind to the same centers of the brain where you would get addictions. So it was not a narcotic. That's why the National Institute of Health was interested in that. You can see that there's potential for studying this molecule and seeing how it's working and maybe coming up with even safer analogs. Problem is, they had to grind up 750 frogs to get one milligram. So there's no way, there's no way you could get this molecule in enough quantity from natural sources. You have to have a way to make it. And that's important. Um, so we need synthetic chemists. Another interesting story is the uh, molecule on the top. It's a little more complex molecule. You can see it's uh, somewhat of a complex structure, uh, something I would never ask you to tell me how to make in, in this class. It took a team of, I don't know, 100 scientists 10 years in order to synthesize this molecule for the first time and work out all of that chemistry. Uh, but it's isolated. It, it's a molecule which was isolated from the bark of a yew tree in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And it was found to kill ovarian cancer cells. Um, and it, it, it is now one of the best treatments for ovarian cancer and has saved many, many lives. Um, this is a uh, molecule which can be taken from those, the bark of those trees. Uh, they have to actually d kill the tree to get it. They have to cut down the tree, take the bark, extract the molecule out of it. Um, but it's from a plant. So one of the things we think about in, in obtaining materials from natural sources, well, the, you can just grow the plant and make more of it, right? Well, it turns out uh, they... In order to get enough molecules to study, they had to cut down a lot of the old growth forest to get these trees. And then they thought they started these tree farms. They were planting these yew trees in tree farms. And they grew up and they, they cut them down and stripped the bark off looking for taxol. And there was no taxol. It's only produced in the old growth forests. Another problem, right? You have a natural molecule which has a potential huge beneficial human impact. You can't get it from nature because you, those old growth forests, um, you can't wait a thousand years for those forests to produce taxol every time you need more. Okay, it's not possible. So fortunately, they found part of the molecule, the more complicated right half of this molecule, was found in the needles of a common shrub uh, that they could then just collect the needles and not kill the plant. And then Organic chemists found a way to synthesize the rest of it and attach it on and then prepare uh, taxol for therapeutic use. So now it's made on quite large scale uh, in order to treat ovarian cancer. So I think that hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense as to why, at least in my opinion, why organic chemistry is important and why we need to understand something about chemistry. Uh, let's see what time is it. All right. Okay, so let's talk about then where your book starts. Um, chapter one is essentially a review of a lot of the principles that you learned in general chemistry, maybe with a little more detail. Uh, but what's important in order to understand organic chemistry is they have a good foundation, a good uh, grounding in structure and bonding. Okay. Again, organic chemistry, I think, is very visual, uh, very conceptual. So I want to talk a little bit about some of these topics. Atomic and molecular structure, 
uh, how that structure of atoms leads to bonding and building of molecules, properties of those molecules, and then probably one of the most common types of interactions, acid-base type of reactions uh, in chemistry. So when we think about structure, okay, structure is like a foundation, right? Um, the bones, what, uh, what a, a object looks like in three dimensions. That's really important too, three dimensions. And I keep stressing this because in order to understand chemistry, you have to understand this in three dimensions. Structure defined as the sequence of connections that defines a molecule, including the spatial orientation of those connections. Um, we'll talk later on in this semester about uh, chirality and chiral molecules because life is inherently chiral or handed. Uh, there's handedness in nature and in, in molecules. Um, and it's very difficult to control which mirror image of a molecule you might uh, generate. And that's critical for biology. Uh, so spatial orientation and knowing structure is, is crucial. All right. So let's start at the basic. Um, an atom. Is, it, is an atom the smallest particle in the universe? No. No. We all, we all know this, right? Atoms, atoms are not even the smallest particle. They're subatomic particles. We have nucleus uh, that contains protons and neutrons. Around the nucleus, we have electrons, right? You know, hopefully, you know the basic structure of an atom. Um, mass of an electron, 10 to the minus 31, relative to a proton and neutron, which is 10 to the minus 27. Both small, but obviously, the electron is uh, almost in, insignificant in the mass of an atom because it's the protons and neutrons which are the heaviest. So we take the simplest one, right? We have this sort of picture in our mind of what, let's say, a hydrogen atom looks like. You have a nucleus which exists in hydrogen, which is just one proton. Around that, um, sur around that positively charged proton is a negatively charged electron. Uh, where is that electron? Where is it located? Sure. We don't know for sure. It's it could it could potentially be found in a sphere around that proton. Okay, but we never know for sure where it is. So I, I think some of these pictures of atoms like circling, you've seen those animated pictures of atoms, electrons circling around a nucleus. That's not really real. They're not going around in orbits. Uh, we don't actually know how it moves. We just know that there's a probability of finding it somewhere in that space. Uh, remember some of the basics from general chemistry. Um, if you look at a periodic table, you see the elements uh, shown there. You see a couple of numbers. You have the um, uh, mass number. That's the mass of the atom uh, crudely to the nearest one digit. Uh, the atomic number. The atomic number is the same as the number of protons. Okay. So, for example, if carbon is six, has an atomic number of six. There are six protons in the nucleus, right? Six protons in the nucleus, but it has a mass of twelve. Why does it have a mass of twelve? Atomic mass. <coughs> six neutrons. Yeah, protons and neutrons are roughly the same in mass. So. Uh, if you have six protons, then you must have six additional units of mass, which would be neutral or neutrons. So you have a mass number of 12. Okay. If you have six protons, how many electrons has to be in the atom? Six. If you look at just in the atom, well, atoms don't usually exist just by themselves, but if you did, six protons would have to be balanced with six electrons. Okay? So atomic structure. Uh, but as we said, we don't know exactly where those electrons are. Um, this is actually defined by some rather complicated mathematics, which um, I certainly don't want to do. Um, it bores me to tears. Uh, but, but they are defined 
by uh, wave functions which describe regions in space where electrons might be found. Okay, um, particles have properties of both um, waves and particles, uh, and the quantum mechanics helps us uh, understand some of that. But and we tr one of the problems is we try to put that into pictures. These are just mathematical functions. So just keep in mind when we talk about orbitals uh, in molecules, it's not like a physical circle. Sphere. It's a probability of where you might find electrons. And we don't really know where they are. Orbitals are wave functions. Um, and they are defined by all of those mathematics uh, as to the energy of those, which gives us an idea about um, electrons. So we have Associated with an orbital, there's a, a principal quantum number, which is essentially related to the energy shell. You probably learned um, energy shells, right, for atoms. The uh, first energy shell, second energy shell, third energy shell. That's associated with the period of the periodic table. Angular momentum, uh, magnetic spin, these are all uh, uh, concepts of atomic structure. So quantum numbers uh, here, when we talk about the uh, shell of an atom, this is representing a nucleus, and then the electron shell. So a hydrogen atom has just one shell, right? Uh, if you go down to the next row on the periodic table, you have two energy shells. If you go down to the next row, you have three energy shells. Um, the shapes of those is described by the angular momentum. So here we have an S orbital, which is described by the mathematics as being spherical in shape, as I showed the hydrogen atom. Again, it's not a ball, it's empty space. The electron could be anywhere in there, most likely. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the shape of the orbitals. So we know that there are different kinds of orbitals, and it's just defined by the mathematics as to the shape. So an S orbital is spherical, a P orbital. Uh, is more of a dumbbell shaped, uh, and really those are. I'm not. Gonna, we don't have to worry about D and F orbitals too much in organic chemistry. Those are for transition metals. Uh, we need to be mostly concerned with S and P orbitals. So we know that every shell has an S orbital, right? Uh, and then once you get to the second shell, then you have P orbitals, which are roughly shaped like this. Again, like the region where you most likely to find electrons that are contained in that orbital. And there are three of them, each oriented in a different direction. X direction, Y direction, Z direction. Okay. And then each of those electrons, there can only be two in an orbital. Hopefully this is all coming back to you, right? You can put two electrons in each orbital. They have to be opposite spin. The electrons can't be the same spin in the same orbital. Uh, that's just related to this spin quantum number. Uh, but you probably spent some time constructing electron configurations, hopefully, in general chemistry, right? Yes? It's actually pretty easy. Uh, depending on the atom and how many electrons there are, you just fill them up into the higher and higher energy shells. So in the first energy shell, there's just one S orbital, which can hold two electrons. If you have more electrons that need to go somewhere, uh, they're filled then into the second energy shell, first with the S, and then with P's, and so on. Uh, I'm going through this a little bit because it will help explain some of the structure for carbons and organic molecules. So back to the periodic table. Right? Periodic table is constructed in a way which makes sense of how the number of electrons are filling various levels. So if you look at the very top level of that periodic table, that's the first energy shell. That's the first period of the periodic table. Um, just hydrogen and helium. Uh, as you go from left to right on the periodic table, you're adding, an, uh, you're adding electrons, right? So the hydrogen atom has one electron. It goes into the 1s orbital. Helium has two electrons. They get paired up into the, two, into the 1s orbital. 
Once you get to the, the third element, there's no more room on that first energy shell because there's just an s orbital there. Those electrons have to go somewhere else. So you go to the second energy shell. That's the second period. Where on the left side of this uh, periodic table, um, lithium would have an electron in the, in the two, two s orbital. Beryllium would have two electrons in the two s orbital. Okay. Now that orbital's filled, where does the next electron have to go? To p orbitals. Okay, we have three p orbitals. So all the way over here, this block is talking about p orbitals. Okay, these are s orbitals. See how the periodic table works? I don't know if this was explained to you in the past. p orbitals. So you get to the second shell, and once you fill that all the way up, you get to neon, it's filled, the second energy level is filled with S and P's, then you go to the third energy level. Okay, and then you start with the three S orbitals here on the left. Three S orbitals, let's see if I can write, okay. One, two electrons as you go to the right of the periodic table, right? When, you're, when you fill that, then you have to go to the p orbital. So this aluminum has one electron in a p orbital. Silicon has two electrons in p orbitals. Three, four, five, until you fill all the p orbitals and get to argon. Then you go to the next level on the periodic table to the 4s and so on. Now, look at what happens here. Once you get to the 4s, if you remember your electron configurations, you had to go to to d orbitals and start filling those. And then once you get to here, then you go to the f orbitals. So we won't get there with organic chemistry. We're going to be sticking mostly up here. So mostly uh, 2s and 3s, 2ps and 3ps. Okay, so anybody uh, not remember electron configurations? If you if you if you do have trouble remembering what you've learned in the past about electron configuration, you might want to go and brush up because it does help us understand how bonding in organic molecules work. Okay, so I've just listed a couple here uh, to show you. Uh, let's just take carbon for example. Carbon has an atomic number of uh, six, so there's six protons, right, and six electrons, right? So when you start filling those orbitals, you start filling at the first energy shell. Spins, I'll draw arrows to indicate the direction of the spin. So spins are paired, so the first electron goes here, the second electron goes there. Right? Then there's no more room in the first energy shell. The second energy shell has S and P orbitals. So you start filling the S first, it's lower energy than the P's. One, two, okay, so that's four of the six electrons. Then the P orbitals are all equal in energy, so you start filling one at a time, three, I'm sorry, five and six. That's all the electrons you have. So if you think about the electronic configuration of a carbon atom, that's what it looks like. That's where the electrons will be distributed in a carbon atom. Okay, and if you look at all of these, erase that, fill them all in, you can see here uh, on this second row of the periodic table I've, with these elements that I've just highlighted here, various levels of filling those orbitals. Um, the noble gases have every orbital filled, particularly in the highest energy shell. So in the second energy shell, all of the electrons are filled, right? So it's happy, it's stable. That's, that's why we call these noble gases, argon, neon, etc., helium. Their energy levels are filled and stable. The others are not filled and stable. That's why they, they won't exist in these high energy states. They'll try to form molecules and compounds, 
to satisfy filling those empty, those spaces in those orbitals. Uh, so if you look at oxygen, for example, it needs two more electrons to be happy. So it's looking to fill that with two electrons. Uh, lithium, for example. Lithium is missing seven electrons in its outermost or valence shell. Remember that word? The valence shell. And uh, that's referred to as the octet rule because in the second energy level, it's um, two electrons. All of those want to react to form something more stable. Okay, because the electrons aren't happy being like this. So that is why atoms form bonds, to form stable materials, stable substances. Okay, so if, let's just take an example, relatively simple example, um, sodium and chlorine, which you know as salt, right? Sodium chloride. Why do we form sodium chloride? And what does it look like? Well, if you look at the atoms, the atomic structure of sodium and chlorine, here is the electron configuration. We're not going to worry about the 1s shell or the 2s shell in this case. The 2s shell is filled with eight electrons. Okay, but there's one electron now here in the third row that has to go into 3s orbital, which is on, so it's not filled up. Okay, so this has one too many electrons. If you look at chlorine, the highest energy or valence shell has seven electrons, right? The third, 3p, oh, sorry, that's a typo. 3s2, I probably did it over here too, no. 3s2, 3p5. That's the, that's the valence shell of chlorine. Okay? Where would it be happy if it had one more electron, right? Then it'd be happy. It'd be filled with eight electrons in the outermost shell. So what happens when you bring a atomic sodium and atomic chlorine together is an oxidation and a reduction. A, an electron from sodium is given up because now sodium uh, has a stable shell. Sorry, this is wrong. This is a typo two. It's on the third energy level. I didn't fix that. Actually, it's 2s2, 2p6. We took that out of the 3s energy shell. My apologies. Same thing with the chlorine. It's in the third energy shell. Um, so electron goes from sodium to chlorine. Sodium now has the, the highest energy shell that has electrons is the second shell. It's filled. It's happy. Stable. That's why sodium plus is more stable than sodium atom. Chlorine now has its valence shell filled with six with eight electrons in the valence shell. It's happy, but now it's gained an electron, so it has a minus charge, right? It has one more electron than protons. So you get sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Uh, they are forming what we call an ionic bond because they're charged species plus attracts minus and in the solid state you look at sodium chloride you see the minus charged chlorines there in green uh, associated or attracted to the plus charged sodium atoms and it forms a nice cubic structure that's why in the solid it looks like a nice beautiful cube um, ionic bonds are very common among elements from opposite sides of the periodic table. Sodium, if it loses one electron, then it can get happy and stable. Chlorine, if it just gains one electron, it can become stable, right? Because of the electron configurations. But organic chemistry, we're talking about carbon, right? What's the electron configuration of carbon? There's carbon. 1s2 in the first energy shell, that's filled. You go to the second energy shell, 2s2, 2p2. That's the total, all six electrons 
of carbon, four of them are in the valence shell, right? The highest energy shell. So that those four electrons. So in order to become stable, what would carbon have to do? Gain or lose how many electrons? Four, right? In order to, uh, to, if you give up electrons, in order to get to a filled energy shell, the one shell, you'd have to give up the four electrons that are in the second shell. Uh, in order to fill that second shell, you'd have to gain four or more electrons to make a total of eight. You'd have to fill the rest of those p orbitals. Right? Only then is it going to be stable. Um, sodium giving up one electron and oxidizing to become sodium cation is not so bad. It does that readily because it becomes stable. Uh, carbon to give up four electrons would then have to be a four plus charge, or to gain four electrons would have to be four minus charge. That's a much higher energy uh, state than sodium plus. Okay. So what is carbon supposed to do? How does it become stable? Without giving up or gaining electrons. What do you think? Well, I'm not going to give any upper gain anything that I could just Goodness. Exactly. It shares electrons. So this is what leads to uh, most uh, molecules that we think about, organic molecules, covalent bonds, sharing bonds without having to give them up because it's, it's tough to give up that many electrons and become that highly charged. So this concept of sharing of electrons actually was first introduced by Lewis in 1916. Um, and he called this a covalent bond where atoms uh, come together and, and share and form a t much tighter connection. Not an ionic connection, but share electrons so that all of them can be, have their outermost shell filled. So the simplest molecule that has covalent bonding is hydrogen, H2. And why does it do that? Well, hydrogen has a 1s orbital. And, if, and it has one electron in it, and if it wants to be stable, it needs to have two electrons. So instead of forming an H plus and an H minus, why would you separate charge when you could more easily share them and form a bond between them? So the two electrons in hydrogen here are now being shared between them. So both of them are benefiting from having their S energy uh, level filled, their 1s shell filled. Okay, and that's the same thing with uh, many other molecules: fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. You always see those halogens as the uh, diatomic molecule, right? That's because they're sharing electrons. Fluorine, uh, although fluorine could gain an electron and become fluoride, sodium fluoride, sodium chloride. Uh, when they're with each other, they have the same electronegativity. So it's hard to give one atom to the one electron from one to another of the same kind. Instead, it'll just share it. They can bond together. Now both uh, fluorines have their if, have eight electrons around them to fill their uh, 2s and 2p shell. Okay. Um, this uh, octet rule is a little bit of a misnomer, and I, I hate to, to just call things like octet rule, but you probably are familiar with that, right? Um, and that's because anything beyond the second level has eight electrons, second level and above. But if you're just a hydrogen, there's only an s orbital with only two electrons. So do you call that a, a duo rule? Uh, I don't think so. But it's, it's happy and stable with two electrons in the 1s shell only, hydrogen and helium, right? Uh, but octet rule is what it is. Carbon, as I said, needs four. It's looking for four more electrons. So if, if you have carbon that's looking for four electrons, uh, and there's fluorine, which has, who needs one electron, um, they could form bonds, but fluorine can only form one bond. Carbon now could form four bonds, 
And so uh, to be stable, carbon would want four fluorines around it, CF4. Okay, does that, that make sense? I know it's kind of basic and it's probably a lot of review for you, but that's okay. We'll bring everyone up to speed. Um, this, by the way, is what we refer to as a Lewis structure, uh, where we draw the atoms and then all the electrons, including the ones that are just lone pairs and the electrons that are shared. Now, this takes a lot of trouble writing. I have to say organic chemists are lazy. We like to simplify drawing things. So instead of drawing all those electrons, an organic chemist would draw a line between the atoms to indicate the shared electrons. So the two, two electrons on the Lewis structure that would be shared are represented by one line between the atoms. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's two electrons. Initially, one coming from each atom. I suppose it's probably a good time to talk a little bit about structure drawing. Um, we often don't draw those, those electrons which are not bonded with anything, the lone pairs. We often just don't bother writing them. It's assumed that they're there. So, for example, to write CF4, we probably write it like this instead of writing all those electrons. But you should know those electrons are there on fluorine or lone pairs on oxygen or nitrogen or any other atom that we're talking about. You need to know that, even if it's not written. How many should be there? In organic chemistry, we can represent structures in many different ways. Different books, uh, different uh, sources you'll read, we'll represent them differently. Uh, as I said, the Lewis dot structure for an organic molecule would be very, very time-consuming to draw. Um, Another way to draw organic molecules is what we call the Kekulé structure. So here what I've shown, for example, in this molecule is all of the covalent bonds between carbons and carbons, between carbons and hydrogens, and in this case there's one chlorine on this molecule. I haven't drawn any lone pairs on the chlorine, but there are, right? You should know that. Uh, and so you can draw a bond out to each covalent bond, each hydrogen. And that's, that represents the structure with all of its covalent bonds. But we're lazier than that, actually. We, we sometimes condense those formulas. So, and this can be a little bit difficult to read sometimes. This condensed formula that I've shown, it's the same molecule, uh, but just drawn in a linear fashion. And you have to make some assumptions about what the structure is. So the first thing is that all the carbons should be carbon backbone should be bonded to each other. But sometimes they're branched. Uh, so for example, this part that's in parentheses, that means there's a carbon with three hydrogens which is branched off of the carbon which is, has less atoms around it. Okay, so CH. Notice what it looks like down here. This is probably a, a, a easier to represent somewhat condensed structure where we haven't drawn all the covalent bonds to the hydrogens. You say CH3. Uh, but we've drawn the covalent bonds between the carbons and other atoms. That's a common way that we represent these structures a little bit better. Um, of course, almost all of what you'll see me drawing in this class is probably the line structures. Uh, so I want to be really clear how to interpret line structures because inevitably someone always makes mistakes in what this means. So in a line structure, a skeletal structure for organic molecules, we draw <laughs> lines to represent covalent bonds between carbons. So it's assumed that at every end and every connection, there's a carbon atom. Okay? That's assumed. And then every line between Every line in a skeletal structure is a covalent bond. So this bond between carbon and chlorine in this case, we draw the other atoms besides carbons. Notice there are no hydrogens on here. It's assumed you know the number of hydrogens on each carbon. If it has one bond to it, that means the other three bonds have to be hydrogen. So this has to be carbon with three hydrogens bonded to then the other carbon. 
Make sense? Uh, this carbon here is connected directly to this chlorine. There's not another carbon right there. That's the chlorine. That's the covalent bonded chlorine. So if you get used to reading these line structures, it makes it much easier to draw. Uh, just make sure you, you remember at each end and each corner is a carbon. Other atoms are drawn. We leave out the hydrogens because you should know how many hydrogens left to make up four bonds to carbon. Okay, here's some other examples. You can see how some of these structures, like the taxol I showed you before, or some of these structures would be very, very time consuming to try to draw out using um, even the condensed formulas, drawing each carbon or CH3, CH2. Uh, it's so much easier to represent structures um, using lines. Um, again, any other atom that's shown, that's in the molecule is, is shown and uh, Hydrogens on those atoms, like oxygen in this case, are usually drawn out. Okay, any questions on how we represent structures? Oops. Okay, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to uh, start talking about carbon again and the structure of methane. So when you think about carbon, uh, it's valence shell that's forming bonds, right? 2s and 2, and there's an s orbital and 3p orbitals. There are four electrons already from carbon, you can form four more bonds. And so something like CH4 methane uh, seems reasonable, right? But in three dimensions, it has a structure which looks like this it's a symmetric structure. It's not flat on the page. It's uh, actually a tetrahedral. So each of the bonds to hydrogen are spread out as far as they can be in three dimensions from that center carbon point. That defines a tetrahedron. Uh, the bond angle between CHCH is uh, 109.5 degrees, and that's true for every bond in that molecule. But does that structure make sense with what you know about the shapes of orbitals? What's the electron configuration of carbon? Right here, right? Atomic carbon has this electron configuration. The s orbital has two electrons. There are three p orbitals, two of which each contain an electron. How do you overlap those orbitals and share them with four hydrogens? So if you think about the structure, right, like you have an s orbital, which is spherical. There are two electrons in it. Sorry, this drawing is not very good. Two electrons in it. Then you have three p orbitals, one in one, di one direction. Let me change color here. One in another direction, and then another in the third dimension. Okay. Two of those have an electron. Let's just say the blue one has one electron in it, and the red one has one electron in it. Okay, so then you take four hydrogen atoms, which has an s orbital with one electron. How do you put that around this central carbon atom to make a tetrahedron when these are 90 degrees apart? I think the structure of methane. I'm going to leave you with that question now, and we're going to come back to that after. So think about that on the next couple of days.